Chapter Fifteen of The Lady in Blue by Augusta Groner, translated by Grace Isabel Cobron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Which also concerns Tony. She gave her thirty crowns, exclaimed Mrs. Diesler, sinking exhausted and breathless into the chair Ossip pushed forward for her. They were sitting in the big airy kitchen of the Grey House. Ossip, his injured leg still bound up, was busily cutting kindlings. Mrs. Diesler had just come in, her arms full of packages. She gave her thirty crowns, she repeated as impressively as her lack of breath would permit. You're all out of breath, remarked Ossip without any signs of excitement. Who gave who thirty crowns? The old housekeeper had poured so many bits of variegated information into his ears in the twenty-four hours since Mueller's departure that the young Russian had learned to take them with considerable equanimity. They were not of much value as a rule. Mrs. Diesler took a fresh start. Tony gave the old Crumpholtz woman thirty crowns. Ossip sat up now and laid knife and wood on the table. Who is the Crumpholtz woman? The old beggar who sits by the cemetery gate. I was coming home from my niece's house, and I thought I'd step into the poor young lady's grave for a minute, and Mrs. Crumpholtz told me, she knows me, that she got all that money from the same young woman who was at the funeral with me. When did she get the money? asked Ossip, reaching out for his hat. Mrs. Diesler laughed a rather bitter laugh. Oh, don't exert that sore knee of yours for nothing. You won't catch Tony now, and I'm right glad of it, for I'll never, never believe that she did anything wrong, never. Please answer me, insisted Ossip. Yes, yes, I'm telling you, and I don't mind doing it either, for it can only help Tony. She came to the cemetery the day she went away, June 4th. It was last Friday. Crumpholtz is sure of the date, cause there was a big funeral that day, the old general, lots of people and soldiers and all that. And I think it can't possibly hurt Tony if I tell you this. It isn't so easy for a poor girl to give away a whole month's wages. It shows she was trying to make up for whatever she did, although you can't make me think she did anything wrong, whatever you say. But anyway, she wouldn't keep the money the baron paid her, and I think that's wonderful of her. Ossip gave a light shrug. At the cemetery gate, you say? Yes, but you ain't going there, are you? Your knee's real bad today. I don't like the looks of it. I must talk to the old woman. She can't tell you any more than she told me. I'm not so sure about that. And don't worry, it takes a good deal to kill me. Ossip was out of the door before Mrs. Diesler could enter another protest. But he had a longer walk than he thought, for the old beggar had gone to her home on the outskirts of the city, beyond the tramway lines. When Ossip finally found her, she was disinclined to talk about the money for she seemed to fear it would be taken from her. But when the Russian showed her a ten-crown gold piece, which would be hers if she told him the story, she was quite willing to do what he asked. It wasn't much that she had to say. The young woman who had given her the money had come out of the cemetery after all the people from the big funeral had gone. It might have been about half-past six on the evening of June 4th. She had stopped and pressed something into her hand, a tiny packet wrapped in a torn piece of newspaper. Pray for the two souls in purgatory, she had whispered. Then she walked on rapidly. It was some few minutes before the old beggar had been able to examine the packet for others stopped to talk to her. When she finally unwrapped it, she was aghast at the sum. She imagined it must have been a mistake and kept the money wrapped up in a safe place. She thought likely the young woman might return for it. But she didn't come. I think she must have gone away. Did she have any luggage, a valise or the like, with her? No, but she had a bag hanging at her waist, a little bag like people wear when they travel, on a strap. Could you let me have the bit of paper the money was wrapped in? The old woman nodded and limped over to a chest of drawers. She took out a tiny package, three ten-crown gold pieces and a bit of newspaper. It was a torn piece of the Linz Gazette. Ossip took it and handed the beggar the extra ten-crown piece, thereby calling down blessings on his head. Then the lad returned to the grey house and with considerable difficulty elicited from the unwilling Mrs. Diesler a description of Tony's simple travelling dress and the fact that when the girl left the house she carried a light brown leather shawl roll and a black valise. The housekeeper seemed to feel that she was the only bulwark between the absent Tony and a world of enemies. Ossip, as the immediate enemy on the spot, came in for her active hatred. And now tell me exactly what Tony herself looks like he asked finally. The old woman felt like making a face at him. She's mighty pretty, she grumbled. Not too tall and not too short. Nice and round. 
but not fat, and has a clear, fair skin. Hair and eyes? Brown. When did she leave the house on June 4th? Mrs. Diesler thought it over. A little before six, she said finally. Can you tell me anything about her, anything unusual, that people would remember? Mrs. Diesler set the pan she was holding onto the stove with a rattle that expressed something of her feelings of the moment. With both hands at her hips, she turned and faced the young Russian. Oh, yes, you'd like it if I could tell you that she had a club foot or carroty red hair, her only one eye, or something so you could spot her anywhere, wouldn't you? But thank goodness there's a lot of pretty girls everywhere, and what I've said about Tony might suit any one of them, so I'm not scared as to what you can do to harm her. I'm not helping you to catch her and haul her up to court and make her unhappy, not I. She turned to the stove and stirred angrily in the pan. Don't be angry at me, said Ossip gently. I'm only doing my duty, and there's been a warrant with full description out against this Tony for the past two days. If they do get her, it won't be altogether my fault or my credit. So you see, you needn't turn your back on me like that. I can't abide you, snoopers. They're up to no good, believe me. Snooping round and interfering with decent people. There can't be good men that do that sort of work. Ossip sighed. There's one of them, is the best man that ever lived. You may take my word on that. Ossip sent Buchner to the police station with a letter for Commissioner Senfeld. An hour later, many house walls and fences bore a placard asking that whoever took charge of a light brown shawl roll and a black valise during the hour between 5.30 and 6.30 on the afternoon of June 4th said articles being the property of a young woman whose description has been appended. Come at once to police headquarters. The evening paper bore the same notice. The midday meal in the gray house was eaten in a strained silence on the part of Mrs. Diesler and considerable suppressed amusement on the part of Ossip. To the latter's great surprise, Franz Moser dropped in shortly after dinner. I thought you were at the seminary this time of day, said the Russian, pushing forward a chair for his guest. I should be, but I suddenly remembered something which I thought I ought to tell you. Is it so important? I don't know, but Mr. Mueller said that anything which had a bearing on this case might be important, so when I remembered this incident I came at once. Ossip nodded, and the student continued. I remember passing the garden gate here a few days before the murder, and hearing Miss Lehman talking in the garden with someone. I could not see who, but someone with whom she seemed to be on a footing of intimacy, for this person called her Elise. Hmm, that is interesting. Was it a man? No, it was a woman's voice. What did you hear? Just a few sentences. Miss Lehman, I know it was she, for I had heard her voice before, said, You can go away at once if you want to. And the other woman answered, Oh, Elise, all I want to do is be with my two dear ones again. Moser rose and took up his hat. That was all, but I thought you ought to know. Thank you. It may mean a good deal. An hour or so later, a message came from police headquarters asking Ossip to call on Commissioner Senfeld. The commissioner wanted to know Mueller's address in Venice. Enclose the letter in an envelope addressed to Signor Grunwald, proprietor, Hotel d'Italie, the same for telegrams, answered Ossip. Have you important news to send him, sir? Yes, the person, it was a woman, who took care of Tony's hand baggage that evening, has been here, and she gave us information that may be of value. Oh? The woman keeps a milk shop and bakery in a side street not far from the cemetery. Tony came in about six and asked her to keep the things. She said she wanted to go to the cemetery to visit a grave. She returned about eight, took a glass of milk and a roll, saying she was leaving on an evening train. Mrs. Corner, the woman of the shop, asked her where she was going. Tony's answer was evasive. She said merely, it will be an uncomfortable journey. I must spend nine hours on the train without a break on a hot night like this. She looked very tired or even worried. When she returned from the cemetery, the woman said, "'You'll write Mr. Mueller that, sir?' asked Ossip. "'Then I need tell him only my own news?' "'May I know what that is?' "'Only that Tony gave the old beggar woman who sits by the cemetery gate thirty crowns the day she left town, a big sum for a supposed servant to give away. And Mr. Franz Moser tells me that he heard Miss Lehman talking to someone in the garden, some woman whom he could not see. And this woman called her Elise.' and seemed to be on terms of considerable intimacy with her. No woman came to the gray house while Miss Lehman lived there, except a dressmaker who came twice for a fitting. It could not have been Mrs. Diesler, therefore it must have been Tony, the maid. Therefore this poor girl must necessarily have played a part all the time she was in the gray house, said Senfeld with a touch of irritation. Why are you all hounding this woman? 
and taking for granted that she has more to do with the crime than than i am willing to assert for instance she has lied about everything then why not about her relations to elise layman you're hard and cruel for so young a man can't you imagine that necessity would drive her to too many things quite foreign to her own nature i tell you young sir that if you had met this woman you'd be willing to give her the benefit of the doubt all along the line that is for mr Mueller to judge will you tell him what i have told you sir i wish i could tell him something more definite as to what train she took and in which direction she went surely you've thought that out ossip stopped short as he saw the flash in senfeld's eyes i i didn't mean to be presuming sir it's all right my lad Mueller calls you his right hand so i shouldn't be offended if you do remind me of my duty as he has done several times said the commissioner with a good-hearted laugh but as a matter of fact i have reasoned it out somewhat and i might as well tell you the results tony was in the bakery at eight o'clock she could not have reached the station for any train earlier than eight thirty now there is a train that leaves for vienna at eight fifty and reaches its destination without change at five fifty next morning exactly nine hours later are there any other night trains one leaves at ten forty three but lands nine hours later after a change at a junction in a little tyrolean town this girl was no peasant it's far more likely that she belongs in vienna and returned there she could not have gone to munich as she said for she could not have reached munich in nine hours from here and not without several changes by any night train i think it is safe to assume that tony went to vienna i have notified headquarters there as i shall tell mr Mueller. the commissioner rose and held out his hand to ossip the lad took it with a deep flush of gratitude at the comradely tone of the official's words he felt that he was indeed coming back to an honourable place in the world that had cast him off and again the young russian soul melted in a silent prayer of gratitude to the man to whom he owed it all as soon as he returned to the grey house ossip sat down to study the bit of paper tony had wrapped around the money she gave the beggar it was a piece of the lynx gazette of june second is it mere chance or did she deliberately buy that paper her assertion that Lintz was her home has proved false then suddenly ossip remembered that mrs diesler took the Lintz gazette and stacked up the papers on her living-room table tony might have taken a paper from the pile at random or might have had some interest in the paper because she had regular access to it he studied his bit carefully on one side was half of the column of personals ossip read them word for word suddenly he started a flash of intuition widened his eyes and sent the blood to his head it was an advertisement headed ends valley and it read don't worry am quite calm climbed the tamish peak yesterday awaiting you anxiously no sense in staying on too dangerous bit of good news m performed maria stegen this week ossip studied the lines again and again then went over to the table and took down the papers of the last two weeks he had hard work to suppress an exclamation when he found another personal ends valley in the copy of may thirtieth this one read arrangement stands then we can be sure of the situation let me hear from you and ossip found one more ends valley personal this one on june third was quite short day after tomorrow early morning don't come for me day after tomorrow murmured ossip that was june fifth this girl arrived in vienna on the morning of june fifth and she was communicating through this paper with a man it must have been a man women don't usually climb the tamish peak a man who is a mountain climber and has some connection with vienna for there is a well-known church maria stegen in vienna we are getting warmer and warmer mr Mueller can't help finding them both now the young russian wrote his employer a long letter pasting in the three personals he enclosed a letter from berlin which arrived while he was writing his own then he himself took the night train for Linz. End of chapter 15